Yeah, okay. This one is spinning off of the Age of Sail article. It is the spice trade, as I may have said. Um, the Age of Sail article undoubtedly has a lot of things to spin off of and see. Um, I tried to find some that are short. Well, I tried to find some that are related to Sail that might be short without getting into like Age of, you know, Age of Discovery, Age of Navigation. I'll do those later, no doubt. But Spice Trade is one of them. I also clicked on the Clipper article for the uh, the actual boat Clipper. Long ass article. So we'll start with this. We'll see how we feel in. And we'll go from there. <clears throat> so the Spice Trade. The Spice Trade involved historical civilizations in Asia, Northeast Africa, and Europe. Spices such as cinnamon. cinnamon <laughs> Always start off the, the videos with a mispronunciation or a stutter. Um, spices such as cinnamon, cassia. Cassia? I actually don't know that one. I really wish I... Chinese cassia or Chinese cinnamon. Okay. Hi, doggy. Sorry, doggy is looking at my screen. Hello, girl. How you doing? I told you I'm not going to give you any human food. I never have and I never will. Okay. Spices such as cinnamon, cassia, cardamom, ginger, pepper, nutmeg, star anise, clove, and turmeric were known and used in antiquity and traded in the Eastern world. These spices found their way into the Near East before the beginning of the Christian era, with fantastic tales hiding their true sources. The maritime aspect of the trade was dominated by the Austronesian peoples in Southeast Asia, namely the ancient Indonesian sailors who established routes from Southeast Asia to Sri Lanka and India, and later China, by 1500 BC. These goods were then transported by land towards the Mediterranean and the Greco-Roman world via the incense route and the Roman-Indian routes by Indian and Persian traders. The Austronesian maritime trade lanes later expanded into the Middle East and Eastern Africa by the first millennium AD resulting in the Austronesian colonization of Madagascar. Within specific regions, the Kingdom of Aksum, from the 5th century BC to the 11th, 11th century AD, so, yeah, 5th century BC to 11th century AD, uh, this Kingdom of Aksum had pioneered the Red Sea route before the 1st century AD. During the, okay, I'm sorry, yeah, that uh, kingdom was around from, 5th BC to 11th AD, but they pioneered the Red Sea route before the 1st century AD. During the 1st millennium AD, Ethiopians became the maritime trading power of the Red Sea. Right on, Ethiopians. By this period, trade routes existed uh, from Sri Lanka, the, Ro the Roman Taprobane. I did not know about that. That was Sri Lanka, the Roman Taprobane and India, which had acquired maritime technology from early Austronesian contact. By mid-7th century AD, after the rise of Islam, Arab traders started plying these maritime routes and dominated the Western Indian Ocean maritime routes. Okay, I kind of want to read over some more of this real quick, just make sure it's in my head. So, there were spices coming from the Near East, before the Christian era, and uh, it was kind of—it seems it was kind of hidden how or where they were exactly coming from, um, and the trade was dominated by Austronesians, uh, Indonesians as well, who had roots in Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka and India. Um, goods were transported by land towards Mediterranean and Greco-Roman world via the incense route. Um, and the Austronesian maritime trade lanes later expanded into the Middle East, yada, da, da, da. Within specific ring regions, this kingdom of Aksum, which I apologize if I'm pronouncing it wrong, Aksumite, so Aksum probably is right. They pioneered Red Sea route before the first century. And during that first millennium AD, the Ethiopians also were trading on the Red Sea. By this period, trade was existed from Sri Lanka, which was the Roman Taprobane, and India, who had acquired maritime technology from early Austronesian contact. 
Okay, so this is just information rich. Arab traders eventually took over conveying goods via the Levant, Levant, sorry, Levant, Levant, and, oh, like Levantine, I, I guess it's via the Levant, and Venetian merchants to Europe until the rise of the Seljuk Turks in 1090. Later, the Ottoman Turks held the route again by 1453, respectively. Overland routes helped the spice trade initially, but maritime trade routes led to tremendous growth in commercial activities to Europe. The trade was changed by the Crusades and later the European Age of Discovery, during which the spice trade, particularly in black pepper, became an influential activity for European traders. From the 11th to the 15th centuries, the Italian maritime republics of Venice and Genoa monopolized the trade between Europe and Asia. The Cape route from Europe to the Indian Ocean via the Cape of Good Hope was pioneered by the Portuguese explorer, by the Portuguese explorer navigator Vasco da Gama in 1498, resulting in new maritime routes for trade. This trade, which drove world trade from the end of the Middle Ages well into the Renaissance, ushered in an age of European domination in the East. Channels such as the Bay of Bengal served as bridges for cultural and commercial exchanges between diverse cultures, as nations struggled to gain control of the trade along the many spice routes. In 1571, the Spanish opened the first trans-Pacific route between its territories of the Philippines and Mexico, served by Manila Gallon, 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 served, served by the Manila, the Manila Galleon, originally known as La Nau de, Ch de China, and Galleon, okay, I guess it is Galleon, sorry, they, they opened the first, in 1571, opened the first trans-Pacific route between its territories of the Philippines and Mexico, served by the Manila Galeon. This trade route lasted until 1850, 15, sorry, 1815. So that is a good, um, a good three year, 300 years of trade. Or no, it's like 250. The Portu Portuguese uh, trade routes were mainly restricted and limited by the use of ancient routes, ports, and nations that are difficult to dominate. The Dutch were later able to bypass many of these problems by pioneering a direct ocean route from the Cape of Good Hope to the Sunda Strait in Indonesia. And we'll look here at European access to the economically important Silk Road in red and spice trade routes in blue was blocked by the Seljuk Empire around 1090, causing the Crusades and by the Ottoman Empire in 1453, which spurred the Age of Discovery in European colonization, or colonialism, rather. So there it is. Spice trade routes in blue, Silk Road in red. Since the, the routes were blocked by the Seljuk Empire, the Crusades started. And then by the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Age of Discovery was uh, spurred, <laughs> to use their word. The origins. People from the Neolithic period traded in spices, obsidian, seashells, precious stones, and other high-value materials as early as the 10th millennium BC. The first to mention the trade in historical periods are the Egyptians. In the 3rd millennium BC, they traded with the land of Punt, which is believed to have been situated in an area encompassing northern Somalia, Djibouti, Eritrea, and the Red Sea the Red Sea coast of Sudan. The spice trade was associated with overland routes early on, but maritime routes proved to be the factor which helped the trade grow. The first true maritime trade network in the Indian Ocean was by the Austronesian peoples of, of island Southeast Asia. They established trade routes with southern India and Sri Lanka as early as 1500 BC, ushering an exchange of material culture like catamarans, out-trigger boats, lashed lug and sewn plank boats, and pong, and cultigens like coconut, sandalwood, banana, and sugarcane, as well as connecting the material cultures of India and China. 
Indonesians, in particular, were trading in spices, mainly cinnamon and cassia, with East Africa using catamaran and outrigger boats and sailing with the help of the westerlies in the o Indian Ocean. This trade network expanded to reach as far as Africa in the Arabian Peninsula, resulting in the Austronesian colonization of Madagascar by the first half of the first millennium AD. It continued into historic times, later becoming the Maritime Silk Road. So just to say that again for myself, Neolithic people were trading in some high value stuff. First record with the Egyptians, um, which was in the third millennium BC with the land of Punt. Spice trade was associated with overland routes early on. Mm -mm. Trade routes with uh, with Austronesians and Southern Indians, Sri Lankans, via catamarans, at trigger boats, lashed lug, and stone plank boats. So that's a cat. It's got these dual pontoons or dual uh, hull um, at triggers are as such. Lash glug. Whoops. Um, pond. I thought that was a food. Yeah. This, um, like, hallucinogenic stim stimulant and narcotic. Yeah. And cultigens. Cool. Yeah, so they kind of learned about boats from each other and traded stuff. Established some light lanes, Austronesian proto-historic and historic maritime trade network here. Oh, we saw this picture on the age of sail. This makes a little more sense now that these were kind of initial trade routes in the red, I guess, and that perhaps this route also existed and perhaps the secondary route was taken around. But yeah, it definitely shows the Austronesian influence. Cool, cool, cool. Um, spice trade from India attracted the attention of the Ptolemaic dynasty and subsequently the Roman Empire. There's some star anise. I don't know what that is. There's cardamom. Maybe fennel, clove, frankincense, myrrh? No, no, that's not myrrh. I'm sorry. That's frankincense. That might be another type of frankincense. Maybe eh, that looks like maybe that's fennel seed. This is cumin seed. Can't tell what that is. Oh, that's an, is that another type of frankincense? I'm disappointed I don't know that. That's not like rose. No, it's not rose. That's maybe just rice. Don't know. That's not turmeric, is it? Turmeric's like a root, right? Shoot, now I want to know. Turmeric. No, yeah, that's not turmeric. I cannot tell what it is. Yeah, turmeric's like a, a root. Very rooty. Huh, I don't know. I don't know what that is. Somebody gonna be like, oh, you dumb dumb. It's a, uh, an apple. I don't know. Roman trade with India according to the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea. Or no, Ur. Er Erith Erythrian? Pardon me. Yeah, I don't know. But this is a picture. A map, rather. A figure, if you will. Yeah. Okay. In the first, first millennium BC, the Arabs, Phoenicians, and Indians were also engaged in sea and land trade in luxury goods such as spices, gold, precious stones, leather of exotic animals, ebony, and pearls. The sea trade was in the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. The sea route in the Red Sea was from Bab el Mandeb to Berenike. Berenike? I don't know. Uh, from there, by land to the Nile, and then by boats to Alexandria. Luxury goods, including Indian spices, ebony, silk, and fine textiles, were traded along the overland incense route. In the second half of the first millennium BC, the Arab tribes of South and West Arabia 
took control over the land trade of spices from South Arabia to the Mediterranean Sea. These tribes were the Ma'ain, uh, the Ma'ain, Kataban, Hadramaut, Saba, and Himyarite. In the north, the, Nabat- the Nabataeans took control of the trade route that crossed the Negev from Petra to Gaza. The trade enriched these tribes. No kidding. South Arabia was called Eudaemon, Eudaemon, Eudaemon Arabia, the elated Arabia is what that means, by the Greeks. Um, It was called that by the Greeks and was on the agenda of conquests of Alexander of Macedonia before he died. The Indians and the Arabs controlled Arabs. I'm sorry, is it weird to say Arabs? The Arabs. (laughs) I'm sorry. The Indians and the Arabs had control over the sea trade with India. All I can ever think of is from Community, from the pilot episode, when um, Pierce, Chevy Chase, says, Abed the Arab. That's all I can ever think of, which is not good, because he is, like, stereotypically racist. So, whatever. Uh, Sorry, Arabs. Uh, Had control over the sea trade with India. Um, In the late 2nd century BC, the Greeks from the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt learned from the Indians how to sail directly from Aden, Aden, to the west coast of India using the Mansu winds, as did Hippolus, and took control of the sea trade via Red Sea ports. Spices are discussed in biblical narratives, and there is literary evidence for their use in ancient Greek and Roman society. There is a record from Tamil texts of Greek of Greeks purchasing large sacks of black pepper from India, and many recipes in the first century Roman cookbook of Pisius, uh, sorry, and many recipes of the first century Roman cookbook of Pisius make use of the spice. The trade in spices lessened after the fall of the Roman Empire, but demand for ginger, black pepper, cloves, cinnamon, and nutmeg revived the trade in later centuries. Let's uh, look at some hyperlinks real quick. See if we get any pretty pictures. Neolithic is old, New Stone Age. Spices, yeah, we get that. Ooh, look at those pots of spices. Obsidian, nice black stone occurring, sorry, volcanic glass, rather, formed on lava, extruded from a volcano, cools rapidly with minimal crystal growth. Igneous rock. Seashells are pretty. Precious stones are pretty. Land of Punt. The land of Punt was an ancient kingdom known from ancient Egyptian trade records. It produced and exported gold, aromatic resins, blackwood, ebony, ivory, and wild animals. Something about recent evidence. That might be reading more into Somalia, Djibouti, Eritrea. They're all uh, Eastern African countries. The Red Sea. Sudan, also Eastern African. Northeast African, they specify. Austronesian peoples, hey, good culture, look at that. Island Southeast Asia, oh, okay, Maritime Southeast Asia, okay. We already looked at some of those, sandalwood, beautiful, coconuts, banana, sugarcane. Okay. Yeah, Phoenicians was an ancient Semitic Thassalocratic civilization originating in the Levant region of the eastern Mediterranean, primarily located in modern Lebanon. The territory of the Phoenicians extended and shrank throughout history, with the core of their culture stretching from... Oh, heavens, this is a long article. (laughs) Um, Stretching from Arwad to modern Syria... Sorry, Arwad in, in modern Syria to Mount Carmel in modern Israel. General Lebanese region. Okay, that is a long article. Okay, let's move on. Uh, let's see, the Ma'ain, Ma'ain? I don't know. The Khataban? Hadramov? Saba? Himyarai? Okay. Yemen, Oman, yeah, Yemen region. Cool, cool, cool. Ptolemaic dynasty. Yeah, Lagi dynasty. Alexander of Macedonia, he killed. Cool, let's move on. That was just the origins. Which, 
a lot of origin there. A lot of people, a lot of cultures teaching each other, just kind of trading, establishing roots there. Uh, Arab trade and medieval Europe. Rome played a part in the spice trade during the 5th century, but this role did not last through the Middle Ages. The rise of Islam brought a significant change to the trade, as Rad, uh, sorry, Rad, uh, Radhanide, Radhanide? It's an aspirated D. Radhanide. Radhanide. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to move on, sorry. Uh, rise of Islam brought a significant change to the trade as Radhanite Jewish and Arab merchants, particularly from Egypt, eventually took over conveying goods via the Levant to Europe. Sorry, took over conveying goods via the Levant to Europe. At times, Jews enjoyed a virtual monopoly on the spice trade in large parts of Western Europe. The spice trade had brought great riches to the Abbasid Caliphate and inspired famous legends such as that of Sinbad the Sailor. These early sailors and merchants would often set sail from the port city of Basra and, after many ports of call, would return to sell their goods, including spices, in Baghdad. The fame of many spices, such as nutmeg and cinnamon, are attributed to these early spice merchants. The Indian commercial connection with Southeast Asia proved vital to the merchants of Arabia and Persia during the 7th and 8th centuries. Uh, Arab traders, mainly descendants of sailors from Yemen and Oman, dominated mar maritime routes throughout the Indian Ocean, tapping source regions in the Far East and linking to the secret Spice Islands, Maluku and Banda Islands. The islands of Maluka, Maluka, oh, sorry, Moluka, which means kind of crazy in Portuguese, but it's spelled different. Uh, Moluka. Um, also find mention in several records. The Javanese Chronicle from 1365 mentions the uh, Molucas and Maloko, and navigational works of the 14th and 15th centuries contain the first unequivocal Arab reference to Molucas. Sulaima al Mahar writes, East of Timur, where sandalwood is found, are the islands of Bandam, and they are the islands where nutmeg and mace are found. The islands of clove are called Maluku, end quote. Malukan, I'm sorry, I just started scratching my eye, and now it's like going crazy. Ew. Uh, Malukan products were shipped to trading emporiums in India, passing through ports like Kozikode, Kozikode in Kerala, which is south, southern, southwest India, I believe, um, Kerala, passing through ports like Kozikode in Kerala and through Sri Lanka. From there, they were shipped westward across the ports of Arabia to the Near East, to Ormus in the Persian Gulf, and Jeddah in the Red Sea, and sometimes to East Africa, where they were used for many purposes, including burial rites. The Abbasids used Alexandria, Damietta, Aden, Aden, and Siraf as entry ports to trade with India and China. Merchants arriving from India in the port city of Aden paid tribute in form of musk, camphor, Ambergris and sandalwood to Ibn Ziyad, the Sultan of Yemen. Camphor, I'm not familiar with that. Waxy, colorless, strong aroma, great. We get a chemical diagram. And ambergris, solid, waxy, flammable substance. Musk. <laughs> Got some deers here. Or, those aren't deer. Yeah, they are deer. Musk deer. Okay. Indian spice exports find mention in the works of Ibn Kurdarba from, from 850. Um, also, Al Qadda. Wait, what is it? Al Kafiki. Al Kafiki. Kafiki. I don't know. Al Kafiki in 1150. Ishaq bin Imran in 907, and Al Al Kalkasandi in 14th century. So basically, Indian spice exports find mentions in works from 850, 1150, 907, and the 14th century. I don't see why they don't put that in time order, lin time, linear or yeah, whatever. Chinese travel traveler Zhuangzhang mentions in the town of Puri, where merchants depart for distant countries. From there, overland routes led to the Mediterranean coasts. From the 8th until the 15th century, 
maritime republics like Republic of Venice, of Pisa, of Genoa, Duchy of Amal Amalfi, Duchy of Gaeta, Republic of, An of Ancona, and the Republic of Ragusa held a monopoly on European trade with the Middle East. The silk and spice trade, involving spices, incense, herbs, drugs, and opium, made these Mediterranean city-states extremely wealthy. Spices were among the most expensive and in-demand products of the Middle Ages, used in medicine as well as in the kitchen. They were all imported from Asia and Africa. Venetian and other navigators of maritime republics then distributed the goods through Europe. The Ottoman Empire, after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, barred Europeans from important combined land sea routes. Okay, and we've got here, what is this? Picture of trade route in the Red Sea linking Italy to southwest India. Yeah, it's straightforward enough. Take a little land break. The spice bazaar used for the spice trade during the Ottoman Empire in Istanbul, which is not Constantinople. I'm, I apologize for having said that. The Age of Discovery, a new route and a new world. Golly, how much more do I have? Oh, not actually that much, because there's a lot of reference material. Cool. Age of Discovery, a new route and a new world. The Republic of Venice had become a formidable power and a key player in the eastern uh, spice trade. Other powers, in an attempt to break the Venetian hold on spice trade, began to build up maritime capability. Until the mid-15th century, trade with the East was achieved through the Silk Road, with the Byzantine Empire and the Italian city-states of Venice and Genoa acting as middlemen. In 1453, however, the Ottoman Empire took control of the sole spice trade route that existed at the time after the fall of Constantinople, and were in a favorable position to charge hefty taxes on merchandise bound for the West. The Western Europeans not wanting to be dependent on an expansionist, non-Christian power for the lucrative commerce with the East, set out to find an alternative route by sea around Africa. The first country to attempt to circumnavigate Africa was Portugal, which had, since the early 15th century, begun to explore northern Africa under Henry the Navigator. Emboldened by these early successes and eyeing a lucrative monopoly on a possible sea route to the Indies, the Portuguese first rounded the Cape of Good Hope in, pardon me, in 1488 on an exp expedition led by Bartolomeo Diaz. Just nine days later, in 1497, sorry, that's not days, uh, just nine years later, in 1497, on the orders of Manuel I of Portugal, four vessels under the command of navigator Vasco da Gama continued beyond to the eastern coast of Africa to Malindi, it sailed across the Indian Ocean to Calicut on the Malabar coast in Kerala, in South India, the capital of the local Zamoran rulers. The wealth of the Indies was now open for the Europeans to explore. The Portuguese Empire was the earliest European seaborne empire to grow from the spice trade. So just to kind of recap that, um, what is it? The Byzantine Empire fell, or sorry, the... When Constantinople fell, yeah, the Byzantine Empire basically fell, the Ottoman Empire blocked off, well, took control of that uh, spice trade and laid a really heavy tax. And so Western Europeans didn't like that, so they were like, let's find another way around, another way to, um, to get our spices. And that led, I suppose, then to the Age of Discovery. And... Um, yeah, so Portugal started sending people down south of Africa. They already had experience in Africa. Um, so they are feeling pretty cocky and felt like they could do it, if I summarize well. Yeah. In 1511, oh, and this is happening in the 1400s, the mid-1400s. In 1511, Afonso de, conquered, de Albuquerque conquered uh, Malacca for Portugal, then the center of Asian trade. East of Malacca, Albuquerque, Albuquerque, I don't know, 
sent several diplomatic and exploratory missions, including to the Moluccas, which were islands, if you recall. Learning the secret location of the Spice Islands, mainly the Banda Islands, then the world source of nutmeg, he sent an expedition led by Antonio de Abreu, or Giabreu, no, Portu European Portuguese is the Antonio de Abreu to Banda, where they were the first Europeans to arrive in early 1512. Abreu's expedition reached Buru, Ambon, and Saram Islands, and then Banda. From 1507 to 1515, Albuquerque. Uh, tried to completely block uh, Arab and other traditional routes that stretched from the shores of Western Pacific to the Mediterranean Sea through the conquest of strategic bases in the Persian Gulf and at the entry of the Red Sea. By the early 16th century, the Portuguese had complete control of the African Sea Route, which expanded through a long network of routes that linked three oceans, from the Moluccas, or the Spice Islands, in the Pacific Ocean limits, through Malacca, Kerala, and Sri Lanka to Lisbon in Portugal. The Crown of Castile had organized the expedition of Christopher Columbus to compete with Portugal for the spice trade with Asia, but when Columbus landed on the island of uh, Hispano Hispaniola, which is now Haiti, instead of the Indies, the search for a route to Asia was postponed until a few years later. After Basco Núñez de Balboa, crossed the Isthmus of Panama in 1513, the Spanish crown prepared a westward voyage by Ferdinand uh, Magellan to order, or sorry, prepared this uh, westward voyage by Ferdinand Magellan, or Ma Magellan, uh, in order to reach Asia from Spain across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. On October 21st, 1520, his expedition crossed the Strait of Mangala, Magellan, sorry, Magellan, how about that? Cut across the Strait of, Ma of Magellan in the southern tip of South America, opening the Pacific to European exploration. On March 16, 1521, the ships reached the Philippines and soon after the Spice Islands, ultimately resulting decades later in the Manila Galean trade, the first westward trade route to Asia. After Magellan's death in the Philippines, navigator Juan Sebastian Elcano took command of the expedition and drove it across the Indian Ocean and back to Spain, where they arrived in 1522 aboard the last remaining ship, the Victoria. For the, first, for the next two and a half centuries, Spain controlled a vast trade network that linked three continents, Asia, the Americas, and Europe. A global spice route had been created from Manila in the Philippines or Asia to Seville in Spain, Europe, via Acapulco in Mexico, North America. And that is the end of that sentence. Okay, so, yeah, had a lot of expeditions going, and eventually the Spain kind of found, the Spain kind of found the, uh, the one that stuck. Cultural diffusion. One of the most important technological exchanges of the spice trade network was the early introduction of maritime technologies to India, the Middle East, East Africa, and China by the Austronesian peoples. These technologies include the plank sewn hulls, catamarans, outrigger boats, and possibly the Latin sail. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Okay, that, cool. It's like a um, Alcord sunfish. This is still evident in Sri Lankan and South Indian languages. For example, Tamil Patavu, Telugu Padava, and Kannada Padhu, all meaning ship, are all derived from proto Asperionesian Padau, or sailboat, with Austronesian cognates like Javanese Padahu, Karazan Padau, Maranao Padau, Cebuano Padau, Samoan Holau, Hawaiian Halau, and Maori. Parao. Cool. That's fun. Austronesians also introduced many Austronesian cultigens to southern India, Sri Lanka, and eastern Africa that figured prominently in the spice trade. They include bananas, Pacific domest domesticated coconuts, Dioscoria, no, di Dioscoria, yeah, okay, Dioscoria yams, wetland rice, sandalwood, giant taro, Polynesian arrowroot, Ginger, yeah, ginger, 
lenguas, pale pepper, betel, betel, areca nut, and sugar cane. Okay, giant taro. We always get that in our um, bubble tea, right? I think that's the same one. I did not mean to open that. No! Polynesian arrowroot. Oh, that must be the other thing that was in the picture up north is arrowroot. Because that, that looks right, at least. Lenquas, I am not familiar with at all. A plant in the ginger family used largely as an herb in Unani medicine and as a spice in Arab cuisine in Southeast Asian cookery. Okay. Tailed pepper. Um, or java pepper. Fruits are gathered before they are ripe and carefully dried. Okay. Betel, betel, piper, betel. Be, be, yeah, betel. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Areca nut. Does this look vaguely familiar? Yeah. And sugar cane. Hindu and Buddhist religious establishments of Southeast Asia came to be associated with economic activity in commerce as patrons. Yeah, sorry. It, it was econ they came to be associated with economic activity and commerce as patrons, entrusted large funds which would later be used to benefit local economies by estate management, craftsmanship, and promotion of trading activities. Buddhism, in particular, traveled alongside the maritime trade, promoting coinage, art, and literacy. Islam spread throughout the East, reaching maritime Southeast Asia in the 10th century. Muslim merchants played a crucial part in the trade. Christian missionaries, such as St. Franz Xavier, were instrumental in the spread of Christianity in the East. Christianity competed with Islam to become the dominant religion of the Moluccas. However, the natives of the Spice Islands accommodated to, uh, accommodated to aspects of both religions easily. Aren't they good? The Portuguese colonial settlements saw traders such as the Gujarati Banias, South Indian Chetis, Syrian Christians, Chinese from Fujian province, and Arabs from Aden involved in the spice trade. Sorry, yeah, so the Portuguese colonists saw all those people involved in the spice trade. Okay. Epics, languages, and cultural customs were borrowed by Southeast Asia from India and later China. Knowledge of Portuguese language became essential for merchants involved in the trade. The colonial pepper trade drastically changed the experience of, moderni of modernity in Europe, and in Kerala, it brought, along with colonialism, early capitalism to India's Malabar coast, changing cultures of work and caste. Indian merchants involved in spice trade took Indian cuisine to Southeast Asia, and notably present-day Malaysia and Indonesia where spice mixtures and black pepper became popular. Conversely, Southeast Asian cuisine in crops, was, in crops was also introduced to India and Sri Lanka, where rice cakes and coconut milk-based dishes are still dominant. European people intermarried with Indians and popularized valuable culinary skills such as baking in India. Indian food adapted to the European palate became visible in England, in England by 1811, as exclusive establishments began catering to the tastes of both the curious and those returning from India. Opium was a part of the spice trade, and soon people involved in the spice trade were driven by opium addiction. That is sad. And that is also all of that article. There are a lot of, um, of references here, as well there ought to be. Um, I would like to read some of them, but I know I won't. Um, or maybe I will. I don't know. Who's to really say? I'll scan through it later and see if there's anything particularly interesting. Until then, I do kind of want to... Well, did I look at all the pictures down here? No, I didn't. So, Portuguese India Armada, Armada's trade routes in blue since, since Vasco da Gama, uh, 1498's travel, and its rival Manila Acapulco Galeon's Spanish treasure fleets in white, established in 1568, about 60 years later, after Vasco da Gama. Yeah, they were really moving. 
must have been, <laughs> man, to, to pay off on stuff like that. You're on a boat for, I imagine, a long ass time uh, for you to, you know, one day see land. And yes, like make massive discovery. Granted, there are probably already, well, there were already people there. But according to the quote unquote known world, you know, didn't exist yet. Image of Calicut, India, from George Brown and Franz Hugenberg, uh, Atlas, Civites Orbis ter- ter- Terrarum, I don't know, whatever, Terrarum, 1572. Isn't this pretty? We got some nice uh, Chinese boats over here. Other boats in that trigger. Some canoes, these people that are Almost as big as this uh, fortress, cathedral, I don't know. Uh, yeah, they, they do not have something that says not to still, unless that's what cumprilucio means. This guy is bigger than most of these massive ships and significantly larger. Eh, I wouldn't say significant. He's large. This guy just bouncing on top of this elephant boat, building boats. That's a cool picture. Cool picture. I see a face here, eye, eye, and a mouth. Great. Dutch ships in Table Bay docking at the Cape Colony at the Cape of Good Hope, 1762. I love these old nautical age of sail paintings. I think that's probably why I searched for this article in the first place. I I think I like visited a couple antique shops and just saw a ton of old uh, age of sail paintings. They are so beautiful. Like what a what a seemingly majestic time period. No. Sorry, give me one second here.